In the meantime, let's talk a little bit more about what we've just heard from Laura Trevelyan. The editor of the Slugger O2 website, Mick Fealty, is on the line. Good morning, Mick. What did you make of what you just listened to? Oh, it was fascinating, really. And, uh, you know, for Laura to kind of put her, her head in the, 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 the lion's mouth, I think, like that, and to kind of come up and come and be so open, I think, about what it feels like subjectively uh, to be related to someone um, who has... I, I think you're right when you when you observe. I think it, it, the name Trevelyan has now taken on a mythic status that it certainly didn't have. Um, uh, bef- you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, because that song, many of us have sung it at sporting occasions, um, and it's become emblematic of of something uh, bigger. But it it's also one of these things. I mean, the, the danger of myth making, and and I think I think the Trevelyan family are really uh, not. I don't want to use the word victim in the context of the Irish famine. Um, but but the, one of the problems with myth making is that it kind of misdirects historical um, attention to the to to the wrong things. The truth is, Trevelyan was just a senior civil servant in the Treasury at a time when uh, England and Great Britain, I think, were, were had been in the grip of the market fundamentalism of the day for some fifty or sixty years. Uh, and, and where basically protecting markets was more important than protecting citizens. Uh, uh, and, and I think Trevelyan, the Trevelyan name has simply attached itself mm. to, to the politics of that time. You know, the, you know uh, and, and, uh, and I think, I think the, the problem with it is that it's giving rise, or the potential is that it gives rise to yet another form of modern bourgeois hatred, uh, which is something we've really got to be uh, got to be uh, on our guard against. Do you accept Laura Trevelyan's argument as such that there is a differentiation between what the Trevelyan family did in a personal capacity with the slave trade and what Sir Edward did in a professional capacity in terms of the Irish famine? Absolutely, it's it's totally it's totally true, and the, 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 I guess I would go further and say. It, 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 you know, he just happened to be there when the ship went down. Uh, the truth is, the now, Irish some fans, historians w- w- would dispute that and say that he was the driver. Well, he was. It, look, it, he he was being directed by the prime minister at the time, which was Lord John Russell, um, who had displaced Robert Peel. Peel in early eighteen forty six had wanted to get rid of the, the the Corn Laws and actually did get a, a statute through. Corn laws were those things that really protected um, uh, uh, protected um, food exports. So that's why the corn was leaving Cork Harbour and or Cove Harbour and uh, uh, harbours all over Ireland. Um, so Trevelyan wasn't the driver of that. He was the political serv- He was the political servant of that idea, which had been mains- had been uh, like a mainstay of British politics for the previous. Uh, 50 or 60 years. And the the other thing is, that the truth is, that what Trevelyan had nothing to do with was the structure of the Irish economy, which was was singularly dependent on that one potato crop. Mm. Uh, so that peasants uh, in Ireland were completely dependent on what was otherwise a very nutritious uh, okay. crop. But the truth is, the potato crop had failed several times before that, and it's it failed... Catastrophically, right across Europe, it's only in Ireland where the the economic structure of the time uh, meant that thousands, thousands, and uh, even millions kind of mm. died uh, died of it. McFeelty, stay with us. We're going to do more on this after the news. It's half past nine. Get the news. Make the news. Be the news. This is the Nolan Show. It's 9.30. A man's been arrested at the scene of a security alert in East Belfast. He was detained by police following a one-car crash on Alexander Road, close to Castlereagh Police Station. Army technical officers are at the scene and a number of homes have been evacuated. Roads have also been closed and the public's being asked to avoid the area. 
The UN is sending a special envoy to Sudan to coordinate the international aid effort as fighting between rival military groups enters a third week. A ceasefire there has been repeatedly broken. NHS England has warned staffing levels in some areas of the country will be exceptionally low today because of the walkout by nurses and lower than on previous strike days. It's the first time action by members of the RCN will affect critical services such as intensive care. And the funeral for two victims of last Thursday's crash on the A5 will take place later today in Straban. Brother and sister Christine and Dan McCain died along with their aunt when the minibus they were travelling in was in collision with a lorry. Let's talk quickly a little bit more about this story about Trevelyan, the fields of Athen Rye and the Irish famine. John's on the line from Ballamina. Good morning, John. Good morning. Uh, Mark, it wasn't Irish. It was very much anti-Irish, organised by London. The famine. 700 years. Well, there were, there were famines before. There was famines in 1739, 40 and 41. There were famines again in 1825, 26, 27 and 28. Mm. And then the 1845 to 51. It was 700 years of preparation. It didn't happen overnight. What did you make of what Laura Trevelyan had to say, John? Well, it's very good that she's realised that their, her ancestors were up to no good. He was obviously a servant of London. And what do you make about her, what, almost two centuries later, preparing to shoulder some of that responsibility, particularly in terms of the slave trade, in terms of reparations, but at least on the Irish famine, coming onto the BBC... It's not Irish. I take your point. It happened in Ireland. Okay, I take your point. Hold on a minute. It also happened in large parts of Europe. There's a potato blight which affected the northern half of Germany, Holland, Belgium, the northern half of France. The only place where people died was Ireland. OK, I take your point. What do you make of Laura Trevelyan? John, bear with me. No, you hold on a wee minute. Because we're we're talking about this, and we will. We will, you're right. We maybe should widen it out and have a closer look at what happened during the 1800s across Europe. But what do you make of Laura Trevelyan bearing up as such on this issue? I'm glad to hear this. Good... uh, to hear that, that somebody's starting to speak the truth. And if, you, if you'd if you bumped into her in the 1990s and she said, hello, how are you, I'm Laura Trevelyan, would you have gone, aha, are you one of those Trevelyans? Of course, yes, I would. I mean, the name would have immediately rung a bell, yeah, of course. Mick Fealty, what uh, about if, you? If she's talking about reparations, tell her, uh, the, I don't know how rich or otherwise they are, if they've a lot of money or not, but if they're going to make reparations, tell her, uh, we need bricklayers and carpenters and people like that to help with the housing problem. We don't need money. Money would just uh, cause inflation. John, thank you. Mick Fealty, what about you? If you had met Laura Trevelyan in Carrick Fergus or Carrick Moore, she was all over the place back then and she introduced herself. Would you have known back in the 1990s, ah, Trevelyan? Yeah, I would have done. I mean, probably not. There was uh, a certain amount of commemoration of the famine at the 150th anniversary back in uh, 95 of the onset of the, the famine and I did a lot of kind of deeper examination and reading back then so I would have understood uh, I, w- I would have recognised the name but I would have also understood the kind of the the, the role of Trevelyan, you know, he was hard uh, and hardened in his response and the, and the truth is Ironically, the Tory the Tory PM who who was in before Russell um, did send uh, famine relief, and but all of that dried up as soon as these uh, uh, as soon as the regime the regime uh, sort of changed. So, you know, it, it, look, and the other thing is, Mark, when you when you go back and you look at the absolute epic scale of the Irish famine. You know, and John's right. Though, you know, I mentioned myself. There were other kind of minor fa- famines, which were indicating that the potato was not the reliable crop that it, that, it, that it seemed to be at the time. Um, but nobody, nobody twigged on. It was what we would call in modern parlance, kind of a black swan event. Uh, and I don't think, uh, I don't, I don't think people really, and certainly 1845 and 1846, really understood 
the consequences of this mass failure of the stable crop. Um, mm. So, you know, I, I, so I, I, and this is, uh, you know, uh, and Laura herself has said, look, you know, you, you, it, it's very hard to kind of unpick the strange morality of the mid uh, 19th century, yeah. where victims were often blamed for their own. And I, I, I tell you, back in '95, I spent uh, I spent hours, like literally seven or eight hours, reading through uh, old copies of the newsletter and the fierce war that was going on between the, the editorial writers of the newsletter with the Times of London, defending the people of the south and west of Ireland, where. It had it hit the, the absolute worst, certainly in those early years. Uh, it, it, the passion of uh, of those Belfast journalists in defending uh, the integrity of 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 the people who who were being blamed by London and by the Times of London uh, for their own demise is, is, is a thing to is a, is a thing to behold, and certainly it's a, it's it's an experience that will live with me for a very very long time. Mick Fealty, thank you. If you want to find out more about all of this, if you missed maybe the top of the programme, you can listen to that remarkable interview with Laura Trevelyan again on BBC Sounds. There's also a full write-up on the BBC News NI website.